All right, well, good morning, everyone. We'll get started this morning. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF. I want to welcome you to uh, an event this morning looking at uh, the question of how the United States broadband system compares to other nations around the world, particularly to the OECD. And uh, we have a great uh, panel this morning who uh, with three great respondents who are going to respond to a report that uh, we've, we're releasing today that's been led by uh, Richard Bennett, who's the senior analyst here for all our telecom work. So I'm going to start by introducing our speakers. I'll just make a couple of remarks. Richard will go through a PowerPoint presentation just summarizing the report. We'll hear comments from each of the three respondents, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. And we will also uh, wrap up precisely by 10.30. So uh, starting uh, media on my left, Richard Bennett is a senior fellow at ITIF. Uh, he has a 30-year background in network engineering and standards. Uh, he's the vice chair of the IEEE 802.3 task force. He's contributed, was, was, not is, was contributed to Wi-Fi standards and a whole lot of other things. Uh, he's also a member of the BitTag technical working group for the, it's related to the FCC and has been appointed to a two-year term with the Singapore Infocom Development Authority. Next, pardon? And renew. Uh, next is uh, Mindel Delatore, who's the chief of the International Bureau at the FCC and been in that position since October of 2009. And, and as a, in that role, she leads the FCC's efforts internationally, including uh, licensing of satellites, international long distance, broadcast stations, and submarine cables. She was previously at the FCC uh, in the 90s as Deputy Chief of the Telecom Division for the International Bureau, uh, and has been uh, Vice President of the Telecom uh, Management Group. She's also been a member of various U.S. delegations, so it's including to the ITU and the radio, uh, World Radio Communications Conference and others. Uh, and she has a JD from the University of Texas. Next is uh, John Horrigan, who's the Director of Media and Technology Institute at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. And John doesn't need any, uh, any if anybody uh, follows uh, internet or broadband data, then you know John's work. He's really been the leading uh, scholar in this, in this area for many, many years. Prior to coming to the Joint Center, he was Vice President of Policy and Research at TechNet. Uh, prior to that, he was with uh, the FCC's uh, National Broadband Plan, doing a lot of their data adoption, uh, data uh, adoption and usage data. Uh, prior to that, he had been nine years at the uh, Pew Internet and American Life Project, and also has a Texas connection. I think actually, uh, so far three have a Texas connection. John has a PhD from University of Texas. Richard has a Texas accent. <laughs> yeah, and, and Scott once visited Texas. As quickly as possible. That's hard to do when you're driving through it. Uh, Scott uh, Walston is the Vice President of Research and a Senior Fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. He's an economist who's focused uh, extensively on issues around telecom regulation, competition, and technology policy. He's also a senior fellow at Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy and a lecturer in public policy at Stanford. Um, and ha again, has a long, long background in this. Was economics director for the Broadband Task Force as well. And he holds a, a PhD in economics uh, from Stanford. So just a couple of quick points uh, before uh, Richard jumps in. We uh, released a report back in 2008 called Explaining International Broadband Leadership. And it was probably one of the first reports to look at this question in an in-depth way of where we ranked. And um, what's interesting uh, since then uh, is, is there are some things that are similar to that report and some things that are different. One of the things in that report that we didn't uh, cover because the data weren't available was deployment. So uh, for a long, long time, people conflated adoption and deployment as if, they were the t as if they were the same thing. Now, since that report, the OECD releases data on deployment, in other words, the spread of the actual physical network. Uh, so that wasn't there at the time. Uh, we also, at the time, when we looked at adoption, there weren't data available or readily available on computer ownership. And as Richard will talk about, that's a pretty critical factor in, in broadband adoption. And it really fundamentally changes where the US rank was. Um, and the last thing I think that's really fundamentally changed since then is uh, uh, at that point in time, you had sort of 
three different systems, if you will, kind of the European DSL system, the emerging fiber system in Korea and Japan, and then our system. And, and what you've seen is a somewhat of a stall out of the European DSL system because they've re reached the limits of their, of their capabilities on, on uh, medium length or shorter copper loops. Uh, the expansion of the fiber system in Japan, I just got an email from a colleague in Japan talking about the fairly serious stimulus package that the Japanese put in place in, in 2009 on to deploy fiber. Uh, the Koreans have done the same. And then in our country, really real expansion of uh, DOCSIS 3.0. And uh, when we wrote that report, there was really almost no fiber on the, uh, the telecom side. And since that time, Verizon deployed its Fios network, AT&T extended fiber in, the, in deeper into the neighborhood. So things have certainly changed, so don't stand still. And on that context, uh, I want to turn it over to Richard to talk about where we are today. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. And I guess, it, you know, for all my fellow Texans here, I'll say howdy. How y'all doing? Good to see y'all. Okay. Yeah, so to uh, pick up on the last point that, that Rob was making, we've seen an, an awful lot of uh, technology come into the marketplace in, in the last five years. And I think the the lesson that, that certainly one of the key lessons in, in looking at international broadband systems is that you can be misled if you take a snapshot and just sort of look at, at where things are at a certain point in time. It's more important to try to look at the trends over time. And that's what we've tried to do in this report, which we weren't able to do uh, in, the, in the report five years ago, is, is look at which way the arrows are pointing in terms of the dimensions of the broadband problem where we're making progress and the dimensions where we aren't. Um, and so looking at the, at the change factors is critical. Uh, and the motivation, uh, there are actually kind of two motivations for doing the report. One of them is simply to, to bring the findings up to date because so much has changed over the last five years. But there's also a fairly critical disconnect in the public policy discourse of that international broadband rankings right now where Neely Cruz, who's the uh, the top policy official in the European community is in charge of ICT, uh, digital life, and broadband development, uh, is sounding an alarm all over Europe to the effect that the United States is basically in a position to crush Europe in terms of the, the deployment and speed of broadband networks. And Europe's policy that's emphasized uh, over-the-top intramodal competition over DSL is reaching a dead end, as Rob said. And she's looking at the deployment of, of DOCSIS in the United States and, and noting that 80% of uh, American homes are passed by a service capable of delivering 100 megabits per second. Doesn't mean that everybody can go buy that today. The technology's in place to do that, though. And that uh, this system in the United States, unlike the European system, has primarily been built by private investment, private capital. And with the uh, you know, the deficit problems that we have in the U.S. are certainly not unique to this country. Other nations are looking at what they can do with the minimum of public expenditure. But in the United States, you hear a completely opposite story. Uh, people like uh, David K. Johnson, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, just wrote a book called The Fine Print that says the United States is 29th place in broadband and falling fast. Susan Crawford uh, has just released her book, Captive Audience. Uh, which says we're 22nd place and falling. So how can, how can, obviously these two opinions cannot both be right. I mean, either the United States is moving ahead of Europe or we're not. And so one of the things that we wanted to do in this paper, in this report rather, is to look at the objective empirical data and find out you know, which one, of, which side of this argument is right. They could both be wrong, but it's unlikely that they can both be right. Um, so when you, when you look at the broadband problem overall, there are four dimensions you have to look at. The deployment of networks, which is basically just the coverage, right? It's the number of homes and businesses that could subscribe to broadband if they wanted to, and what kinds of options they have in terms of, <coughs> of the service packages. Uh, the second dimension is adoption, which is just the subscription rate. And typically, in, certainly in the journalism around this subject, journalists almost always confuse these two issues. So if a nation is short on deployment, then that is the fault of the broadband service providers 
for not bringing networks you know, to the neighborhoods where people could subscribe if they wanted to. But if a nation is falling short on adoption, meaning that, say, in the United States, almost a third of all households don't subscribe to broadband service, you can't intrinsically just blame that on the broadband service providers. The service is there, provided that it's at a, at a reasonable price, and people have interest, then they will subscribe. So if there's a lack of subscriptions, you have to analyze the reasons for that. As Rob said, computer ownership is one of the key issues. There are some other issues as well. Um, and performance, which is simply speed, I think that's pretty well understood. The range of download and upload speeds that are available, and the price. And uh, a lot of what we hear on, on the uh, question of price is, I think, misleading. It's also kind of interesting that these four factors aren't just completely separate from each other. There's a dependency relationship where if you sort of made a pyramid, at the bottom of it you'd have deployment because you can't do anything else if you don't have a network physically there. Uh, adoption comes next. If people don't subscribe, obviously they're not using broadband. And then performance is what you get from the broadband that you subscribe to and prices, you know, what you're paying for that service. So they build on each other. <clears throat> now, America has some unique circumstances. I mean, in, in this country, we're all created equal, but all countries are not created equal with respect to each other. Certainly at the dawn of the broadband era, say in roughly 2000, uh, the United States had a very different situation in terms of the kinds of uh, physical facilities we had that were capable of incorporating broadband. So we had these two physical copy networks, one for telephony, the other for cable TV. And our cable, our cable TV deployment in the United States was second highest in the whole world. We have a, a table in the report on that. The only country that had more cable was Belgium, and Netherlands is right behind us. And those are two very big broadband companies, uh, countries right now. And of course, the reason that we had so much cable TV in the United States is because our population is distributed the way it is. Remember, the very, the very initial sort of business case for cable TV was to bring television signals into rural communities where they couldn't really get a high quality picture over the air. So starting in the 40s, we built this humongous cable television system all over the country with really high quality wires because what it was basically doing was connecting a common television antenna that was up on top of a hill to all the TV sets in the community. And there was no digital technology at the time, so the quality of the wire was really critical to making that work. And that turned out to be a big advantage when we moved into broadband. Uh, and similarly, because of our population distribution, <clears throat> the wiring system that we had for the telephone had longer, they're called loop lengths, because in telephone engineering, signal goes out and it comes back. So every subscriber has their own wire, their own loop. The lengths of those are very long by the world average, which is, wasn't a big deal for telephony because the whole system was tuned around those loop lengths. But when you put digital signals over those wires, which is what DSL is, is digital signals in a high frequency running over telephone wires, in all digital communication systems, the signal degrades with distance. So you can't go as fast in terms of bits per second on 20,000 feet of wire as you can on 3,000 feet of wire. So there's a, there's a potential problem there. So low population density and this proliferation of cable TV meant that America was a more t television centered country than a lot of other places in the world. And even today, adoption of cable television exceeds the adoption of broadband. Ownership of television sets exceeds the ownership of computers. So the computer and broadband and the internet has to compete with television for eyeballs. But uh, I mean, it's not all, you know, these aren't all negatives. We're also close to the key internet resources. It's actually the first public internet exchange in the whole world was built in McLean, Virginia and then quickly moved to Palo Alto. So everybody in the United States was physically closer to that exchange, didn't have to go through submarine cables to get to it. And this is an exchange that allowed three independently operated commercial networks to exchange traffic with each other independent of the NSF backbone. So there weren't restrictions on what they could do. 
And also our technology policy with respect to mobile is more flexible than Europe's has been. Europe mandates a particular technology and we allow people to, uh, to make their own choices. So <clears throat> how broad is the deployment of DSL and cable? Well, 96.3% of Americans have access to some form of wired broadband. Nine, most of that is cable, 85% have DSL, 18% roughly have fiber. In terms of the overall ranking, that concurrent deployment of both cable and DSL puts us in third place behind, guess what, Belgium and the Netherlands, where we heard that before. Okay, so um, this third highest rate of intermodal competition in the OECD means that we were able to adopt a, a competition policy that was based on facilities. So, you know, think back to the dial-up days, you had hundreds of ISPs, right? But basically, they were all selling the same service. You couldn't, dif they couldn't differentiate each other on the basis of speed because they were constrained by, the, by using a common physical infrastructure. In the broadband world where we have competing facilities, the telephone company, traditional telephone companies, traditional cable companies can compete with each other on the basis of speed, also price, also customer service, and then, you know, extra factors. Um, now, at this point, one of the really interesting trends in deployment, you, you often hear, well, cable is the, a looming monopoly and they're, they're taking over, they're gobble, gobbling up all the, all the uh, business. But in fact, in the most recent quarter, the fiber-based services offered by the telephone companies, that's Fios and Uverse and CenturyLink's version of Uverse, actually added more subscribers than cable did. Uh, 750,000 Fios and Uverse subscribers in the third quarter compared to about 575,000 for cable. Long loop DSL, though, is, is really hurting. I mean, they coughed up about 800,000 subscribers. But overall, both the telephone companies and the cable companies are adding subscribers at this point. Market share is pretty much the same as it's always been. 57% cable, 43% uh, phone company right now. 55-45 has been the split for about the last 10 years. But in addition to the uh, services that we, you know, that we follow this closely, there are things that are taking place below the surface that aren't getting a whole lot of attention. One of them is there was an, an, an extraordinarily large fiber buy by American companies in 2011. 19 million miles of fiber optic cable. And that's the, that's the biggest year for fiber in the U.S. ever. 2000 had been the biggest year and for 10 years after 2000. New fiber installs were lower than they were in 2000. So the glut of fiber that was created by the internet bubble of the 90s has been used up. We're installing fiber at an incredibly fast rate, 15% faster than all of Europe. Um, in terms of fiber to the, oh, I had a chart. There's a chart that says, Imagine, close your eyes. <laughs> the United States is sixth in fiber to the home, ahead of France, which is a, a country that's supposed to have a lot of it. Uh, of course, we're the world leader in LTE adoption. Uh, by the last count, the majority of the world's LTE users are in the United States. LTE is significant because it's the first mobile broadband in which internet protocol is built into the stack doesn't go through a gateway to get to, to IP-based services. IP is an essential part of the design. It's not just faster, it's also a whole new architecture. And 4G and LTE don't mean the same thing. And so what this, one of the, the implications of that is it's another, uh, another pipe basically to get service to rural areas. The only barrier there is the usage caps. Adoption is our Achilles heel. I mean, there's really no two ways around it. Uh, our adoption rate at rough at 68.2% of all households is not as high as we'd like for it to be. Granted, the, the homes that have computers, uh, the adoption rate's a lot higher. And surprisingly, there are a lot of homes that have computers that are not connected to broadband. Um, and they're not predominantly using dial-up, because dial-up is less than 3% now of internet accesses. 
So these are just computers that maybe people bought to do their taxes on or to do homework or to play games or whatever, but you know, they have they have really no interest in getting them hooked up. But when you look at it in terms of the adoption of the computer owning homes, there's a, well, we're pretty far down this list. We're about, what, 12th on this list, uh, ninth. ninth on this list. The actual spread in terms of percentage points between the top country, which is Iceland, I think we don't have data for Singapore and Korea because they're, they're very high adopters. Um, it's really small. It's less than five percent. So you know, once you once you basically create the interest, uh, it's not that hard for people to go online. So the question is, and I'm really reluctant to talk about this with John Horgan in the room because I'm sure I'll get it wrong. Uh, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about adoption. Hopefully, you know, John can can say that in his remarks. The primary thing that keeps people from using the internet is that they don't see the relevance that the internet has to their lives. So, and, and the second, and that's forty-eight percent. And this is a pew. This is. Did you do this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> second biggest factor is usability. People perceive it as being difficult to. Diffi it's difficult to maintain a computer. The internet's a scary place. There's lots of viruses. People are rude. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> not yeah, I'm not every, well, I, I sh I'll never introduce you to my family members. <laughs> uh, and no computer is 12%. And then below that, we finally get to the price factor, the availability of broadband seems to be a barrier to some people, even though actually satellite broadband covers everybody. It's 99.9%. Um, okay, so there are, you know, there are some barriers in terms of people not really understanding what broadband can do for them. And by, by ethnic groups, uh, Hispanics are much lower adopters than African Americans are. And high school dropouts are pretty much the lowest category of adopters overall, which suggests to me that, that you know, we talk a lot about digital literacy. I think it's basic English language literacy is one of the one of the key issues here. Okay, in overall speed, quickly changing subjects, Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Netherlands, and Denmark are the perpetual top five in terms of download and upload speeds. I think the best data on internet speeds in general is from Akamai. They produce a, every quarter a state of the internet report and because of the kind of business that Akamai is in, their content delivery network, they have to know how fast they're serving up content to all the people who come to them to, to basically, a, a lot of the, all the high volume websites that you visit on a regular basis are, are likely to be hosted by Akamai or someone else who's in that business. The visibility they have and the behavior of the overall internet is just awesome. They have, literally every quarter they see more than a billion unique IP addresses. And they keep track of the speeds that each of those billion IP addresses is getting on every visit. And so they publish, you know, every quarter, the average speed of all the IP addresses in each country, or at least for the top countries. The average peak speed, which actually measures how fast the network is, is operating, is the average average is complicated by a whole lot of computer factors. And then they, they have a very interesting metric, which is high-speed adoption. So in terms of, if you want to know how fast the average broadband connection in the United States is right now, it's basically 30 megabits per second. This is both residential and commercial. So the average network capability that Americans are using when they get on the internet today is roughly 30 megabits per second, spread out across the whole country businesses, schools, and homes. Of the top 10 fastest nations, the speed is roughly 37.9 megabits per second. So we're eight megabits behind, which is not, um, I think that American number is higher than you would expect. It's about double what UCLA reports, and there, there are reasons for that, because UCLA is basically the hospital. You know, people go to UCLA because their connection is sick, and they want to see what's wrong with it. 
so you just as you can't assess the health of a nation by checking people in hospitals you know you want to know the health of the general population you go the Akamai route um, and speeds in America are rising faster than, than they are in the top 10, which is not really surprising. Now, they have this very interesting metric, which is high speed broadband adoption, which to me is that if you want one metric that overall assesses you know, the, the four factors uh, that, I've, that I've mentioned, high speed adoption is that figure. Because what it tells you is they, every quarter, they set the threshold for high speed, low speed at a certain level. They just raised it from 5 megabits to 10. What proportion of the users in a country are above the threshold? And in this measurement, the United States is seventh in the OECD and eighth in the whole world. Hong Kong's the, the wild card there. So this is really measuring the diffusion of high-speed technology, because to get a high ranking on this category, you have to have fast networks. People have to be choosing the packages that give them the high speeds, those which they're not going to do if they're not priced appropriately. So this is kind of the overall readiness of the population to adopt higher speed applications. Mm -hmm. Six minutes. Okay, and uh, they also measure the average average speed, and in terms of that, because the speeds of any given IP address will fluctuate. See, a lot of these are firewalls, so people behind the firewall are sharing an IP address, so an IP address doesn't map to one particular computer. So, if you're in a corporate situation, you have 50 people that are using this IP address, the the speed is going to go down. Uh, in terms of that measurement, the United States is seventh. Uh, tied with uh, Denmark, which is one of the traditional high-speed players. Uh, as Neely Cruz said on the first slide, 100 megabits is sort of the aspirational goal for Europe right now. And they've chosen that as an aspirational goal because it's a reality in the United States. Uh, and they're one of the, probably the best hope that Europe has to reach that is the adoption of a new form of DSL called Vector DSL. LTE advanced potentially is another another way. So right now we have you know you can DOCSIS three and with fiber you can get 100 megabits. In the near future, vector DSL and LTE advanced will add two more avenues to that. The advertising claims that that the United States ISPs make about the speeds they offer are fundamentally correct. It's been proved by the Sam Nose survey. Sam knows does surveys for other countries in the world. Only the U.S. and the U.K. have decided to publish that data. So we're the world leader in network speed measurement transparency. Um, this also indicates that there's no great demand for more upstream capacity. All the technologies, DSL, fiber, and cable, deliver more upstream performance than they advertise. And that, that tells you that people are not clamoring for symmetrical broadband services. Now, on price, we made a, a, an interesting discovery that, that we certainly didn't expect to see in terms of the pricing for entry-level services, uh, low-end services. The United States is a price leader. Uh, ITU surveys 165 different countries about the prices of broadband packages. And in, 20, in 2008, the United States came in second. In 2010, they added two more countries who came in fourth. Only one of those is an OECD member. Israel, which joined the OECD in 2010. Um, so it's basically, in terms of U.S. dollar, it, $20 packages are, are pretty prevalent in the United States. Our prices on higher speed plans, however, are higher than the international norm. So what we have um, in the United States is a situation, this is from Yokai Benkler, the orange line here is the slope of United States prices. The blue line is the average prices. So at the low end, we're lower than the norm. At the high end, we're higher. I think in tax policy, they call that progressive. So that this is a, and this is, I think, in large part, a, a reaction to the fact that, that the other high-speed nations have relied on massive public subsidies We've done some subsidies for broadband in the U.S., but they're really quite token 
in relation to what Japan and Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong have done. Uh, the reason for the high prices are not excess profits on the part of the carriers. Uh, there, unfortunately, this is just a, a simple <coughs> net profit slide for the, the public, publicly traded uh, broadband providers in the U.S. and the EU 15. The, our profitability rate is less than 2% in Europe, 8.2%. Uh, if you look at the corresponding numbers for return on equity and return on invested capital, you see the same pattern. So if anyone is telling you that American broadband providers are ripping off the American people with excess profits, ask for the proof. All right, this is, I mean, this financial data is publicly available. So, uh, as I said, subsidies have not been a big part of the picture here. Obviously, in Japan, the massive subsidies, Japan now has DSL, cable, and fiber, 100, 100 megabit and gigabit fiber to the home. The prices are dirt cheap, and they're, they're lowering them, but the adoption rate for broadband in Japan is no higher than it is in the United States. And, and one of the anecdotal stories is actually that there's a fairly reasonably large uh, defection taking place where people are dropping the fiber broadband service in favor of LTE. And it's not because LTE is faster, but LTE goes where you go. Okay. Uh, the, the, the thing that's fundamentally behind our high, co our high prices uh, for high-end services is high costs. It goes back to that, pop uh, that population distribution theme. Just not only Ameri not as many Americans live in cities as people do in other countries, but even within our cities, we have less density. So you know, if you've been to Seoul and Tokyo and um, Hong Kong and Singapore, you know, those are largely vertical nations. I, I lived in Singapore in, in the mid '80s, and my commute was actually more vertical than horizontal. I went down from the 18th floor, walked half a block, and then went up to the 21st floor. And you know that, and in in nations like that, the indoor wiring is a responsibility of the landlord. So all the carrier has to do is bring in an optical cable to the basement, and then the landlord has to connect everybody up. In Korea, they have a little certification program where the landlords get get to display a grade for the kind of broadband service they provide. So you're basically paying part of your broadband bill when you pay your taxes. You're paying part of your broadband bill when you pay your rent. And then you're paying part of your broadband bill when you get it from the carrier every month. And that, that's not the way we do the pricing in the United States. You get the bill that you get from Comcast, Verizon, or AT&T is really what it costs. Oh, there's a few taxes in there too, aren't there? So um, fundamentally, what this debate comes down to is not really about facts and figures. I mean, it's transparent that the arguments that say the United States is falling behind the rest of the world are just not empirically sound. So why are we having this debate? Well, it, you know, it goes back to its fundamental philosophies about public governance. In the Gilded Age, you know, the same debate took place over public ownership of the railways, the telegraph, and the telephone companies. And the populists of the Gilded Age wanted to create, as this cartoon shows, a United States uh, railway and telegraph office and according to a platform that says either the railroad corporations will own the people or the people must own the railroads which to me kind of sounds like you're either with us or you're with the terrorists you know, it's this kind of dichotomy of black and white thinking and it's like this system is just wrong in principle so it doesn't matter whether it's working well or working poorly what matters is just philosophically, this is not the way it should be done. The government should be doing this for the people. Like the Postal Service, which works so well. I guess we couldn't get broadband on Saturday if, you know, if that was to happen. But, I mean, that's fundamentally, I think, what's afoot here, is there's a philosophical disagreement that's pretending to be a factual dispute. So, um, you know, these are the things that I've told you. Uh, I, I probably don't need to, to read those again. We certainly have issues. We're not, you know, as we, we say in the report, broadband in the U.S. is neither a wasteland or a utopia. 
we really need to get a handle on this adoption problem. Uh, it's not simply a matter of subsidies. I mean, it's a basic literacy issue, I think. Uh, we need subsidy programs to bring broadband to rural areas. That's a fact. The FCC is working on that. And uh, spectrum is going to be a constraining factor on the ability of us to do LTE events. So with that, I happily turn over the podium. Oh, uh, the question we asked at the beginning, my unbiased assessment, Steely Neely wins. Okay. And Del, you can do it from there or from up there, either way. Okay. You want to make sure you turn the mic on? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank very much the ITIF for inviting me here today to speak. And um, um, Richard, your report is very good. I sort of liked it because it was a little bit of good news. You know, as the uh, chief of the International Bureau, sometimes we get battered around the world with um, some of our, our um, things. And so it was very, it was uh, nice to, to have sort of the, the good news day. Um, and then um, I've got two staff people here from the FCC who wanted to make sure that I didn't actually say anything wrong, and they're much smarter than I am. And Walt Strack, who's our Chief Information um, Officer, Chief Data Officer at the um, International Bureau, and then Artie Lickman, who is actually one of the uh, main authors of our International Broadband um, Data Report, uh, is also here. So they're right there. I don't see Rich anywhere, but he might be here. He was maybe going to come. Um, I was telling my husband last night, I said, you know, we have to go to work early tomorrow because we ride together into the office, and so we have to get there. I said, we have to be at the, at the FCC by 8, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm on this panel, and I said, I'm on this panel with, like, these three experts on broadband, and they, I don't know why they brought me in, but, you know, I said, you know, they're, they're all, like, experts in their field, and, you know, these guys are just really great. He said, well, they're all guys? I said, yeah. He said, well, maybe you were brought in because you're the broad for the broad <laughs> <laughs> Really? <laughs> so, I don't know why I was invited, but thank you for, for, for inviting me. Um, so, you know, first I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the data collection um, and, you know, that we do at the FCC and the um, International um, Broadband data report, which is a congressionally mandated report that we publish every year. Um, it's part of the uh, broadband progress report, which used to be called the Section 706 report for anybody who like, can, can go through the history. And we collect a huge amount of data on um, broadband pricing and speeds from around the world, and then we evaluate those actually um, in terms of U.S. adoption rates um, as well as the speeds and prices in comparison with other uh, countries. By statute, we have to look at um, 75 um, communities in 25 countries. Now, actually, last year, I think we looked at 38. I think this year we're looking at 40. Is that right, Artie? And so 40 countries. <coughs> and, uh, you know, sort of trying to, to get some of this data, as you can imagine, is a little bit difficult. Our last um, report came out um, in August of 2012, and we're busily working on the, on the new one. And, um, you know, I think that Richard utilized some of the data that, that we that we um, produced, and you know, one of the th thing that things that we try to do is to put some of the data that we've um, sort of collected and, and collated from around the world in Excel and an Excel data sheet. And this is useful for people, uh, you know, like Richard and others around here, that you can then manipulate the data as you wish. And so part of that is that, you know, we maybe at the FCC don't have the resources to be able to, to do all these wonderful reports, but we can actually feed into that. And I think that that's, you know, quite useful um, for, for, you know, the, the, the group here as well as others as well. Um, one of the things that, that, that happened when I came back to the commission in 2009 was we were working on the very first uh, of these reports. And um, when we came in, there was a lot of consternation about what we were going to do with this report and how it was going to come out. And one of the problems that we were facing was that the data was so different. Getting comparable data from all over the world was so different, so different, and so I mean, so different, <coughs> different, and so difficult. You know, you couldn't get oranges to oranges. You ended up with mangoes to kiwis, or you know, something. And so we were trying to get to a, a, a place where. Um, we could actually compare this data for the, the purpose that the, you know, the, the, you know, the statute said we had to do it in these 75 communities. So it was one of those things where, you know, 
extremely, extremely um, labor intensive. What we were doing was having teams of people, um, we use a lot of free interns because we don't have enough people to, to actually do all of the work, but um, was to basically find, um, go to websites and find um, the information from the carriers. And so a lot of it is, you know, the advertised feeds, obviously, that, that, that these carriers are doing. And so we, you know, utilize a, 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 an intern that actually spoke Spanish. They would go to, you know, different things. But, you know, when you're trying to find something from the Iceland, you know, website, not any of, none of us speak Icelandic. And so, you know, it's a little bit harder to, to find that data. But, um, you know, I think we continue to, to do this. And every year that we've done the report, I, I think it's really improved. And I think that, you know, we have to rely on the publicly available data. Um, the next set, you know, every year, as I said, it's, it's improved. And I think in, in this, you know, 2013 report, it'll even be better. Um, we've also added different things over the years. Um, we added mobile. And we've added, you know, sort of different categories within the mobile. So we've divided it up between sort of smartphones and, you know, dongles, um, a, as well as um, tablets. And so, you know, we've got some of those differentiations. Um, and so I think that, that, you know, that the report is getting better um, all the time. I think, um, you know, Richard had some questions about some, some gaps in the data. And unfortunately, that's just sort of the way that it is, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, trying to find this um, information of, um, it, um, it, you know, internationally. Um, and I have to say that I think that it is actually, I'm very proud of the team that, that works on this um, international uh, bug and data report because it has gotten much better. And I think we, we can always get better, but um, with the resources that we have, I think that's one of the things that we're, we're working on now. And, um, you know, we do, we get to these broadband data ranking, you know, the, the, the rankings that, that you've talked about. Obviously, your report was very refreshing because it had some, you know, different, it didn't necessarily emphasize that, those rankings. And I think that, you know, sometimes, as you said, there's a lot of different people who have different views about what the, um, the ranking will be. And um, I think that, you know, sort of sometimes you end up in a zero-sum game. You win, I lose. If we come down, we go up and, and, and that kind of thing. And I don't necessarily think that's really the situation. I think that in reality, we all win when there's more uh, broadband around the world, and particularly for, you know, for, for, for us. And, and I think that obviously a lot of the policy things that we're working on is, is uh, you know, are important. The rankings are important, but also I think the policies to get there, as you mentioned, are, are, are really important. We've got, you know, a lot of different things that we're working on in the States. And I was in China, and, um, and we were talking about broadband and, and different things. And they, you know, they clearly go to all of, you know, John and Scott's, um, you know, websites and, and everything else because they were, you know, they were like, well, and Sam knows, and they knew all these questions about Sam knows. They knew more about Sam knows than I know about Sam knows. So, I mean, you know, I think a lot of it is very interesting to people around the world. They look at our um, public-private partnerships like, um, you know, Connect Compete. Um, you know, we've got, you know, that that I think is helping on some of the, the, the digital literacy and, and, you know, trying to get computers out to people. Um, and then we've got the, um, you know, the chairman actually was just talking about the, you know, expanding to super fast broadband. I think just yesterday he was talking about North Carolina and um, the, you know, kind of the research triangle there called the North Carolina Next Generation Network. And so those kind of things, maybe they do, in fact, um, you know, put a little fear in Neely Cruz. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, because they're talking about one gigabit there. And so if, if we can, you know, continue some of those things, I think that's really great. Um, just a minute on the spectrum policy. I think that's also something where the United States leads. Um, maybe we were the first to do the 700 megahertz band or, you know, our digital dividend some, in some other countries it's the 800 megahertz band. Um, but also the fact that we had a flexible use policy and I think um, that was very important. The Europeans are still sort of in that mode of, well, you know, we, we had originally licensed this for 1G and 2G and 3G and I think that, that um, you know, the, the uh, carriers in the United States have been able to take advantage of that. And that's, you know, something that, that makes a big difference. Um, and so I don't have much time, but I just wanted to, as the chief of the International Bureau, I think it's important that we realize that satellite does actually have a place to play um, in the United States. There's about you know seven million unserved homes, and so the the a lot of the new systems that the that the satellite providers are putting up are actually meeting some of the you know the the four gig one gig you know, uh, I mean, <laughs> megabit per second um, goals that the United States has. 
And um, and I, I think that that's an area where we should be, you know, we should be looking at, I mean, time will tell whether that really, you know, whether it really works. Um, but that some of these new satellites have a lot more capacity than, than the old ones. And so I think it's actually you know, becoming more price competitive and, and that kind of thing. So time will tell with that, but I think it's something that we, we need to be thinking about as well. So, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I think you were invited because you have a Texas affiliation, Mendel, in addition to your expertise yeah, and work at the, at the FCC. If it were later in the day, I'd get my Texas hat on and say, let's all get in our rent cars and go have cold beer. <laughs> but um, it's too early in the day even in, in Texas for that. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, first of all, thank you to Richard and uh, ITF and, and Rob for um, having me here and inviting me here to um, talk about this report, which I think is very good. So congratulations to Richard. Um, I'm going to make a couple of comments, um, the first of which picks up a little bit on um, some of Mendel's comments toward the end about sort of the use of rankings in, in policy making. I wrote something five or six years ago when I was at Pew about um, how uh, um, rankings driven policy making can be a little frustrating. That was the time when reliably every quarter or every six months the um, OECD would come out with rankings, and it was at a time when the U.S. was falling, and people would sort of bemoan the um, uh, state of, of the rankings for the U.S. without really talking about what, well, what policies could help change this or what policies would deal with specific problems that, that we know we have. Um, I think in this context of, of the work that uh, Richard has, has done, it's definitely a good thing to take a close look at rankings and uh, you know, peek under the hood. As somebody who's done in different contexts and other contexts, a state broadband index, I know that Rob and his colleagues do these sorts of indices all the time. The first thing you know when you do them is that there are, there's more than one way to skin a cat when you're putting these things together. And the fact that uh, Richard has <coughs> decided to take another look and really scrutinize the data, I, I think is a good thing. And um, the re results are very, very interesting. The second thing just about rankings in general um, that I think it's important for us to keep our heads around is um, it's what's the consequence of being number two versus number five? A couple times in the report, Richard um, talks about that in different contexts, but if you're number five and somebody's number four or two, um, what are the consequences of that in your country? Um, that's a different research question, but if we know that um, there's X percent more adoption in some Scandinavian country than there is in, in the United States, well, what kind of impact is that having on uh, society in those two countries or the economies in those two countries? Um, if some country has access to, um, on average, higher network speeds than this country, well, what difference does that make in terms of people's um, use of behavior? Uh, so those are uh, things I think we have to keep in mind as we look at these rankings, not just where the U.S. comes in, but what the consequences are uh, of different relative rankings. Um, the other comment I want to um, make goes to uh, my area of expertise, which is um, adoption of broadband and how that was handled in this report. And I do have a few uh, quibbles with, with how it was handled in this report. Um, First of all, I think you know when you cast adoption as a percentage of computer ownership, it's um, sort of like me when I was your classic good field no hit infielder in my high school baseball team. Um, you know when I got my bat on the ball, I had a pretty good batting average. But the question was, why can't John get his bat on the ball? Maybe it's a question that's been asked of, about me many times since in very uh, different contexts, but. Um, I, I think it makes sense for a bunch of reasons to focus just on the adoption rate and not get into the two-step of computer ownership and then adoption of broadband as a percentage of computer ownership. I think the report does a two-step when a one-step um, does the job adequately. Um, and let me then take my discussion to the slide that Richard showed from um, maybe it was something I did at Pew five or six years ago. I guess it's more like four years ago. 
about the reasons for non-adoption. You recall that the slide said that something like 48% of people without broadband at home said it just wasn't relevant to them. And let me talk for a minute just about that, the way that slide was constructed, the way that um, data point was framed, and why I chose to do the project very differently when I was at the FCC working on the broadband plan. When you do those survey questions and you ask people, why, why don't you have broadband? You get what's called open-ended uh, responses. You get a lot of responses and you classify them the best you can into different buckets. In the case of the survey question that we used to ask on why people don't have broadband, we get just a range of responses. I don't like it, I don't want it, it's not for me. That um, we couldn't fairly put anywhere else then into a bucket that said, well, it's just not relevant to the responder. And you got that high rate of people saying it's not relevant. Um, and by virtue of doing that a couple of times, you get one a little frustrated by getting this high rate of these sort of diffuse responses about it's not relevant. But then secondly, you also develop hypotheses as to why uh, people may not have broadband at home. So at the FCC, when we were working on the research on uh, non-adoption for the broadband plan, rather than go the route of just asking a single question, asking people why they don't have broadband, we decided to um, do two things. One, we um, uh, read people a list of reasons why they might not have broadband. That would include can't afford a computer, monthly cost is too uh, expensive, um, I'm worried about the bad things that would happen online, it's not for me, I'm, I'm happy with my current service, which would be for dial-up users. So we read the people a list. We let them choose more than one reason. And that yielded um, some interesting results. I'll just read off the data point on what we found um, when people were allowed to choose more than one barrier to adoption. So monthly cost uh, being too expensive uh, came in at 51% who said that the monthly fee was too high. Activation and installation fee came in next at 44%. Um, cannot afford a computer was 32%. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see that, one, people have multiple reasons for not having broadband. Um, cost does matter. Cost of computer, monthly cost of service matters. But there are a lot of other reasons that come into play. So that's an important insight. Um, the second thing we did is after we let people choose more than one reason, we asked them, okay, now what's the main reason you don't have broadband at home? And that resulted in the finding that was cited uh, with some frequency in the broadband plan and thereafter that um, cost is the leading reason. 36% said cost was a reason they don't have broadband at home. That sorted into a couple different buckets. 15% said monthly fee was the main reason they didn't have broadband at home. 10% said affordability of computer. And then a bunch of people were saying that the activation fee was too much. Um, the next most cited reasons, I think I didn't print out that slide, was digital literacy. I'm afraid of what's online, or um, I'm just not comfortable with things on the internet. And then 19% said relevance was the main reason they didn't have broadband at home. So um, I did find the omission of that work um, a little puzzling in this report. Um, the other um, thing to note, though, is that the policy um, suggestions or recommendations that come from the way we did it in the broadband plan really aren't too much different from what um, Richard talked about. Cost has, uh, and, and monthly cost in particular, has a somewhat greater role in non-adoption than um, the work that we're talking about today would, would suggest. But the suggestions to focus on training, digital literacy, are very important, and I'm in complete agreement with those recommendations and suggestions that, that Richard made. But I, I did want to point out that um, there's some uh, consequences in, in terms of looking at the adoption problem that go along with some methodological choices that you might make. But they lead to important insights about the nature of the non-adoption problem, namely that um, the problem is plural, not singular, and also that comprehensive approaches to broadband uh, closing the broadband adoption gap are needed, uh, which are the kinds of approaches we see in a lot of uh, programs that are uh, coming online, whether that's Internet Essentials, the thinking behind Connect to Compete, or a lot of the programs that the BTOP uh, program has funded. So, thank you. Scott? 
Um, so thanks, uh, Richard and Rob and ITIF for inviting me here to talk about this very interesting report. Uh, so I'm just gonna I want to make some brief comments about the report itself, um, and then sort of and then three specific points. How do we think about speeds and other qualities, other uh, measurements of quality? Um, how do we think about wireless in this context? How broadband matters for the economy, and then sort of what I'd like to see in in the future. Uh, so I'm gonna need a lot more time. Uh, I don't, um, so first of all, in, in, in the report, I, mean, I think it's fair to sum up uh, by saying that you know rich countries were all pretty much the same when you look at the equilibrium point where we are in terms of uh, adoption, availability, um, and and even speeds. If you look at what people actually get, and that's about the same as it was um, when I, I wrote, uh, wrote a report uh, uh, on these issues in 2008, 2009, and that's that's approximately the same. All rich countries, you know, were pretty similar, uh, and that stayed about the same. Um, and you know there, there's, there are some pretty big differences in prices, uh, but prices are complicated. Uh, if you look at sort of an, uh, try to find some average price, even though we're comparing all kinds of different things, um, you know there are some countries that are cheaper, uh, like France, much cheaper. But we have a much bigger price range, um, so we score very highly on affordability. Um, but you know for the top speeds, we're really expensive. Um, but without the high fixed cost, low marginal cost industry, that's exactly what you would expect. Um, but on the other hand, it's hard to know then how to think about the effects of these prices because adoption is about the same everywhere. <laughs> France is so cheap, yet adoption is not higher, right? And as an economist who likes downward sloping demand curves, that's really uh, unsettling, right? Um, and so, you know, it's still, it's, it's still, that's still a, a puzzle and, and how to think about prices and what, how you want to think about the variability in prices, the range of prices and so on. Um, and then in terms of adoption, uh, John, John talked a lot about that and, I, and, and how price, how, how affordability and price matters. And I think, the, you know, a fundamental reason behind that, John said that there shouldn't be a two-step method, but a one-step method, but it's still important to think about why, you know, what underneath it all um, causes people to say that it's not affordable. And if you look at, uh, if you look at data from the U.S. Census and, and so on, you see a very clear trend that, um, you know, rich people are more likely to have buy broadband than poor people. And the income gap is much bigger than the, than the rural urban gap, right? Um, and so you, you can see that underlying these, of these adoption issues, which suggests that our policies should focus um, you know, very heavily, more heavily on helping lower income people adopt broadband. Um, then, you know, for example, we focus now almost, almost entirely on rural areas. And that balance is wrong. We should be focusing more on low income people, prob probably with some kind of voucher system. Um, but we don't do that yet. And that's, I think, a mistake because that's sort of a function of and a contributor toward the inequality problem um, that, we, that we have. Okay, now, uh, and that's why I think the, that's what policy should focus, focus on, that's what we don't focus on. But now, um, sort of more generally, how do we think about what, what's, how do speeds matter? How do other measures of quality matter? Well, you know, we know that for today's applications, uh, there's plenty of speed. We, we have more than enough speed. Netflix streams HD video at less than five megabits per second. Now, if you have a 100 megabit per second connection, is your video going to be better? No, Netflix streams out to you at less than five megabits per second to, for 1080p. Um, so, you know, those higher speeds aren't going to help you right now. We also know um, that newer technologies tend to use more bandwidth. And so we'll probably continue to see the trend in um, speed and, and speed that people uh, need to sort of do interesting things online continue to increase. So the question is, the policy question is, um, are policies that increase the rate at which speeds are increasing worth the cost? And that's a question people don't ask. So speeds have been increasing at some rate over time, right? And they have more than kept up with the types of applications that people use. So is it worthwhile to spend money to increase that rate of speed? I don't, don't know the answer to that, uh, but that's the question we should be asking, not whether somebody has X megabits per second. Um, and so far, there isn't evidence that suggests that it is worth spending that. If you take a look at Japan or Korea, for example, I did a case study of, of, of Japan um, uh, about a year ago. I spent some time there talking to pretty much everybody there. And Japan's fiber network is a big problem for NTT. Uh, they built this fiber network. They barely cover costs with it. And they've tried to think of applications that people would be willing to pay for to use the extra speed. Nobody wants anything. Um, and there are no there are no applications that use this speed in Japan. Now, in Japan, they worry about this and they say, "What's happening to Japan that we you know don't have any innovation on that?" That's a different question and a very interesting one too. Um, but so far, we don't see evidence that pushing speeds fa uh, uh, to increase at a faster rate is worthwhile. Um, but that's the that's the that's the question we should be asking. 
Um, now you might wonder if, if I'm sort of making an, a, a, if this is an implicit uh, jab at these gigabit networks here, and actually it's not. Um, I, I don't believe that these you know, sort of gigabit efforts uh, are going to lead to the kinds of innovation uh, and experimentation that the uh, groups that are doing it, like Google and, and Big U and so on, want to see. But uh, I see this competition, right? And you know, we want facilities-based competition in this country, and so that's good, right? Uh, and what we can learn from it will be, uh, hopefully, we can. These will be nice experiments to try to identify what are barriers to entry in this market, and I think those will be very useful things uh, to to see. Now. Um, how do we even know that speed is the right measure? We focus, we focus like laser beam on speed, but um, there are lots of aspects of quality. We don't think about those at all. Um, there's late, I would say at all, but we, there's latency, for example. If you're a gamer, um, you, you don't care so much about bandwidth, but you want to know that when you press the shoot button, the fire button, you, you fire, right? And um, so you don't want there to be a big delay in when you get to kill your opponent. Uh, and that's so, you know, think about something more productive like telemedicine, which is always the biggest thing coming next year. Um, you know, you want to interact with your doctor, even if you want an HD call with your doctor, not only, you know, HD again, five megabits per second, but you want it to be in real time, right? You don't want to have a big lag. So we should be thinking about those things. How do networks affect that? And what, I don't know what other measures are. It's possible someday, now I have no idea because nobody knows what's going to happen in the future, that we find that applications, you know, speeds that applications need level off. But some other measure of quality is really important that we haven't thought about yet, and we need to invest in that. Um, so we need to be thinking about what you know what are the, really the meaningful measures, and speed is one, but we don't know that it's the right one or the only one, or so on. The second, um, wireless as a competitor, it's really hard to think about how to how to include wireless in these um, in competition uh, in, in this country or anywhere else. Now you know it seems in terms of, of speeds, LTE delivers as much as you could possibly want, uh, but you know we also know that it's not a perfect substitute here because of uh, largely because of um, uh, it, there's not enough spectrum devoted to it yet. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the carriers have to still maintain three networks, um, and so partly as a result of that, you know, caps are too low for uh, home use, with some exceptions. Uh, and so it's not a perfect substitute, but it doesn't have to be a perfect substitute. It only has to be a substitute for a certain, for some people, and it has to be the case that the carriers can't identify who those people are, so they can't segment them apart. Now, how are we going to are we going to get there? Are we there? It's not clear yet. This is something to watch. I mean, you know, we all use our mobile devices every day. I'm using this thing right now, which is giving me a 4G connection. Um, how do I, you know, how do I count that? I'm, I'm using broadband. I'm, I'm watching a movie as we, you know, as we do this conference. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, but these are things to think about to incorporate into the future. Now, Scott, you could be watching the live stream of this event while you're doing it, <laughs> and also movie. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm running out of time. It's very quickly, um, you know, in terms of again. So what should we be thinking about? Um, whether these, how these things matter. So all of our measures so far mostly focus on residential broadband. And Richard talked a little bit about some of the, the aspects that are business. Now, mostly policymakers don't like to say it, but mostly home use is entertainment. The vast, vast majority of home use is entertainment. Now, yes, people do tele telecommuting, and some people do move huge data sets around. I, I, I'm one of those people. Um, but for the most part, it's entertainment. And uh, those are not where you get the big productivity boost to the economy. You get the big productivity boost from how businesses use ICTs. And we don't focus very much on that, partly because the data aren't, data aren't there. And we're not even sure what data should be there. Um, and now, that goes to you know, how, would I like to, how I'd like to see things go in the future. Um, which is we have to think about what are the right metrics to follow. So, for example, we still count the number of connections. We do, and the OECD does. You know why we count the number of connections? Well, it's because in 1896, the US Census counted the number of telephones. They did a census of telephones. We kept doing that. We kept counting them. Count them, count them. Every year we count them. Now we count broadband connections. Um, in, in, my, in my humble opinion, that's idiotic. Uh, I mean, we, we should be focused more on, I think, using survey methods, which are much cheaper. Uh, to focus more specifically on certain issues, such as uh, you know low income adoption, right? Uh, that we can we can uh, we can put more emphasis on what sorts of things uh, would help low income people adopt. Job, that's your job. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just watching the movie. Okay. <laughs> uh, and and I think rather than continuing to sort of arbitrarily count these um, metrics that we've been following for a long time. We need to think about what are the barriers to either adoption 
um, or innovation or whatever it is, the ultimate goal that we want. What is the barrier for, to how people are using these networks and innovating on these networks? Do we see any actual barriers to these? Um, and if so, how do, you, how do you attack those? And that's a productive way forward. And I, not that, I don't know that I have the answers to exactly what those are. Um, but I think those will be, um, I think those will be the reports that we'll be very interested in reading in the future. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, thank you, all three. Um, Richard, did, did you want to respond particularly to John, or did you want me to, or I think that's kind of the one point, and then we'll open it up. Uh, if you want to respond on that, don't you? Yeah, so I think, John, I think one of the reasons we did that is, is why we did this two-step process is, is, is in some way the same reason why we talked about the deployment uh, question. The debate over sort of why people are adopting it or not, or how many people are adopting it, is a multifaceted question. And it ends up pretty much 100% in the media being an indictment of the network. And we see that, for example, with when most of the press articles talk about the adoption being 15th in the OECD as a share of households, or usually a share of population. Uh, people say, ah, it must be the network. Well, imagine a world where uh, you have the greatest electrical network in the world, and the prices are 10 cents a month, but we haven't invented electrical appliances yet. Or we have them, but they cost $3,000 each. We go, my god, we're falling behind on electricity use. Uh, people aren't adopting electricity. It must be the network, in which case it wouldn't have been the network. So I think that's in part why it's important to say, well, you know, how, just how widely are the available networks? And in the US, we're number three in the OECD. And then the same thing on adoption, because almost everybody who looks at the adoption question says, for 15th, it must be the network. And then you can say, OK, well, it's not really the network if you just look at, you know, you're not going to adopt broadband if you don't have a computer at home. Now, you could sort of say there's reverse causation. People don't adopt a computer because they don't like the network. But then you have to say, well, OK, but the fact that we have this fourth or second lowest cost for just somebody, you know, there's really, I can't imagine anybody out there going, you know, I really would like to get on the network, but that 100 meg connection is a little pricey for me, so I'm not going to do it when they can get a $20 connection. So that's really, I think, the reason why we did it. And the other point about cost, I think, that's important is people say, well, cost is a problem. Uh, again, I think the reason cost is a bigger problem in the US is not because of price. It's because, and there's some data we show in there, that we really do have the largest share of, of low income people. You know, we, we have a much bigger share of low-income people because of our income disparities. Uh, you compare that to, say, France, where the income is much more compressed, and people on the bottom quartile of income make a lot more than people on our bottom quartile. So that's the only re I think the reason we're saying is, is it's important to look at these factors and not assume everything is network. Yeah, I don't think we're in you know violent disagreement or anything here. Um, I, I would just worry again having been in you know tons of media situations about adoption. I'd just be a little worried about um, some of the media being, we had 88% adoption in this country because here's the data point. Um, so uh, I think the, the media issue goes both ways. Everything else, I'm in complete agreement on trying to push the conversation to the real reasons. And I, and I would agree that the cost issue looms for some people. Um, not necessarily because our price levels are um, excessive. It's about um, people's budget constraints. Um, and uh, so I'm in agreement on that. Oh, that's a good point. All right, so why don't we open it up if you want to identify yourself first. And, yeah. uh, question for John. And John, Link, can you identify? Link Hoeing with Verizon uh, on, the, on the adoption issue. And uh, it goes to how difficult it is to figure out what consumers are thinking in this space. So we did some focus groups, and I attended them a few years ago, on broadband with dial up customers. And ask them the same questions. And the first thing they said, I don't have broadband because it's too costly. When we probed it further, it, it seemed like what the real issue was, was they already pay for te television service, they pay for wireless, and they pay for phone. You put this on top of it, it's too expensive. When you ask them about bundles and they saw the price was lower, they said, well, that might be interesting. Later on in the discussion, a lot of them voluntarily said, well, if my kid gets into school, I'm going to get broadband. So there clearly was a connection there to, you know, I don't really see something that's really commanding me to do this yet. And it's not just the cost issue, it's other factors. I don't know how you react to that. But in terms of your question about cost, I think that it's more granular than that, possibly. Yeah, I think how I was describing it was going very much in that direction. And 
if you look at, um, uh, if you just take the metric, people with school-age kids, um, up and down the income distribution, there are strong efforts among those households to get service. Um, you know, I think the average uh, for uh, families with school-age kids is about 10 or 12 points higher than the national average on, on, on broadband adoption. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, and clearly for dial-up users, for instance, the subject of your focus group, when you sort non-adopters into different groups, um, you know, dial-up users tend to focus more on cost than people who are disconnected, period. So I think the findings from the survey research are largely congruent with what, what you discovered in your focus group. I wonder if, if either, either of you guys have any insights into whether consumers, uh, the prices that consumers perceive they're going to be charged are in line with what they're really going to be charged. I mean, it seems to me, if you ask someone who's a broadband non-user, well, it's too expensive, and so, well, why do you say that? Well, I read in the newspaper that I'm being gouged by the cable company, and so, and they haven't actually checked, right? Actually, it r runs almost the other way, and, and this is off of um, some focus group work we did for the broadband plan. We had um, a team interview 170 non-adopters at libraries around the country, um, and when you ask them what would be, you know, a willingness to pay, and this has shown up in other studies, gets into the 20, 25 bucks a month range, which is what you can get service for. Mm -hmm. When you asked um, uh, people about, well, why don't you have broadband, and these focus groups, costs came up, uh, understandably, quite a bit. They'd go to, well, yeah, I see the offer is 20 bucks a month, but then there are taxes, then there's other things, then the offer goes away in a few months. Even people saying, but then I know I have to um, buy software for my computer for malware. So they were really attuned to the different cost elements and how they would have to deal with those things. These were people; these were very poor people. Um, so they were in fact very attuned to price and, and reasonably well aware of what. So, the price but these are were. people who are actually using uh, broadband in libraries. They came to the libraries for the focus group, which means they probably had been there for uh, uh, using the internet at some point. Yeah. Not necessarily though, but likely. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Over here. Uh, James saying, I have a small definitional question for Mr. Bennett. When you talk about deployment, you talked about um, access to fiber, for example. How does that differ, for example, like in a place like DC where the fiber is deployed but Verizon is still in the process of making it available to people? We just looked at the number of, of the percentage of population around the country that has that as an option. Okay, so it's the people who actually can connect to it, not, not to not having the wire, not having yeah, the it's wire not. Box. It's not the percentage that actually have it, but it, where it's available. Well, it's available. <coughs> commercial. You would have to be able to buy it. Yes. You have to be able to buy it. You have to be able to buy it. It yeah. could be some fiber running in your house, but if they're not selling it to you, it wouldn't count. That doesn't count. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca Arbogast, Comcast. Um, on the Sam knows data, and I apologize because I have to step out for a call, so if you cover this, I apologize, but my understanding is that the Sam Knows reports in the U.S. showed that broadband, the, the delta between advertised and actual speed in the U.S. was quite slight. I think that the aggregate was that the U.S. is about roughly 90 percent. 96. 96 percent. And my understanding is in the UK, where Sam Knows published, they found that the average was that, that the delivery was 50% of the actual speeds. And so just, I guess, two questions. My perception of that is that a lot of the OEC data that talks about price relative to speed is quite distorted because it's relying on advertised speeds as opposed mm -hmm. to actual speeds, and that that's a big... Um, it just a big distorting factor. The question is, uh, I've heard that Sam Knows may be doing some additional studies of other countries beyond the UK. Do you know where that stands and, and when that data might come out? Yeah, uh, Sam Knows is basic. They, they've told us they were on a panel we did here about broadband performance uh, about a year and a half ago. They, they've contracted with uh, over 30 nations and, and all all the continents except Antarctica to uh, to do the, these studies. They've actually completed some of the studies, but they're all proprietary to the to the nation that contracts with them to do the study. And only the U.S. and the U.K. have have chosen to actually make the data public. And so they they've done work and and they're they're preparing to do a really wide scale. Uh, I was going to say fix and to. Uh, uh, do a wide-scale study in Europe. They're they're signing people up because they have to install these these 
uh, test devices in the homes. And I don't know whether that data is going to be public or not. I would suspect it probably will be public. So there's been wide-scale study. There's been very little publication of the data. Uh, and you know what they showed, and you know I put up a slide that had that had what you know what the results were in the U.S. by technology. In the report, we go into that in, in a lot more detail. And um, we also mentioned that in the in the international data report that Mendel's people do, they actually looked at the advertised rates in the OECD and then tried to correct them using Ookla, because Ookla uh, publishes an index where the, of the disparity between advertised and actual. That's fundamentally a flawed approach, I think, because Ookla doesn't know what your subscription rate is. They're guessing the way Sam knows you in, in the first iteration, Sam knows tried to guess what your subscription rate was from what they perceived. And so when the cable companies implemented the turbo uh, mode, you know, where you get the, the boost the speed boost, Sam knows would see that and they'd think, oh they subscribe, they're not a thirty megabit customer, they're a fifty megabit customer because it's above thirty. Right. And then, well, that's a really bad performing 50 megabit connection rather than a really good performing 30 megabit connection. So there, there are difficulties when you just look at the raw data and try to figure out what it means without the proper context, for sure. Um, I'll on you and then, then it's got. Um, just, just to add to that, Rebecca. I mean, when we when we talk with um, with countries internationally, I know that you know I mentioned China, Brazil, Colombia, um, Costa Rica. They've all mentioned Sam knows, and that they you know that they're very interested in, in getting that as well. And you know, one of the things that, that I forgot to mention was that the OE, that, the, that the FCC has sort of started a, a move at the OECD to try to get them to have sort of a, a, a more um, harmonized. Uh, set of data coming in on, on broadband and I think a lot of it has to do with sort of what we're talking about now and so you know we we, we started that in, in 2010 and then in 2011 we actually had um, you know agreement by the OECD and so hopefully this year that will take that will take effect as well so we're looking forward to that as well um, on the uh uh, on the, the prices that the uh, sorry the speeds that the OECD reports yeah those are generally advertised prices but the difference between that and what um, Ukla or um, Akamai reports I think isn't so much th that doesn't really that doesn't reflect the difference between advertised and actual so much as it reflects the difference between advertised plans and what people actually purchase um, and you know very few uh, companies none that I can think of except for Korea Telecom actually will uh, and I don't even know whether they still do uh, make available how many people subscribe to each type of plan um, but generally speaking uh, people people buy the cheapest plan they can and they don't want to pay that much more for additional speed and that was um, you know, that was true in a, in a study of a willingness to pay um, that uh, we commissioned at the FCC that Greg Rost and Scott Savage and Don Waldman did where that people are willing to pay a lot for broadband um, for good broadband, but very little for additional, you know, for incremental speeds. Um, and so, you know, I think when you when you see these actual speeds, it's not because they're not getting what was advertised. It's because they, you know, chose a cheaper plan. Um, and uh, so, and and that's um, you know, that's part of the function of demand and how much people are willing to pay for different types of service, uh, which is part of the um, debate that's often uh, that's often left out. And then and then again on 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 uh, I think you just mentioned. Just briefly on how you compare the price of these a uh, normalized price so the, the typical way is to divide um, the price by megabits per second um, but you know that's that's a really flawed measure net, uh, in the report which talks about sort of the uh, engineering sort of cost reasons why but there's also a demand reason why and that's because people don't value the incremental I in increases the same you know going from one megabit per second to two megabit or say let's say one megabit per second to five megabits per second is a big deal I mean, you know, your performance is much better. Going from 5 to 10, also probably a pretty big deal. Um, but, you know, once you start going above 25, people really don't care anymore. Um, and so, you know, going from 25 to 50, not as big of a deal as going from 1 to 10, right? And also, as soon as you have a gigabit network, then your price is effectively zero because you're dividing by a huge number. Um, and so it's funny. If you look at the OECD reports and there's, you know, the, t the very top uh, plans available now some places are gigabits, right? And so the prices that they have in those countries, zero. So it looks like they're free because you're divided by a big number, but you know, obviously that's not true. Well, and that's the same point with the Netflix. I mean, the uh, they published the average streaming rate that Netflix has to Google Kansas City customers is 2.55 megabits per second. And so you know, you've got a gigabit 
pipe, but there isn't a single application in the world that can fill it up. So, uh, you know, what are you paying for? And, and, and that's not the only service. There are lots of services on the web because of the client server nature of the web. Uh, if, you, if your connection is more than about 20 megabits per second, you're basically never going to be network constrained when you're, when you're accessing any kind of client server website. You're going to be constrained by the performance capacity of the website that you're actually visiting. And so you're literally wasting money if you, you know, if you go for these, unless you're a gamer or you have some specialized use or you have a lot of people in the home that are using the connection at the same time. I mean, when you have teenage children, there's a huge argument for having a really high speed connection because there's a lot of activity going on that you need to share. The same, I'm saying businesses have gigabit connections and 10 gigabit connections because if you have hundreds or thousands of employees that are sharing a connection, it needs to be really high capacity. So we have time for one more question, which I want to go to Fernando. But um, I just want to make this reiterate this point Scott made, which we make in the report with some highlight today. It's a lot of a lot of the critique you hear is, is is it'll be on price per megabit per second. Japan has price per megabit per second 25 times lower than the U.S. or whatever the number is. And and and, and to Scott's point that it really is is fundamentally misleading uh, because it doesn't cost if you move from a 20 megabit network to a 50 megabit network, it doesn't cost six. It doesn't cost 140 percent more to do that. It costs about five percent more to do that. So <clears throat> that's why we focus in the report principally on just prices themselves. Yeah, the, the bigger price, price factor. factor. Distance is a bigger price factor than speed is. Fernando, last question. Uh, Fernando Laguardia, Time Warner Cable, and um, following up on a point that Scott made, um, Richard, I thought the dimensions of broadband policy you pointed out. Uh, are very informative, uh, but as Scott pointed out, it's not all just about speed. That's sort of what we have right now to go on. Um, the fact that we have uh, facilities-based competition here means that we should be looking about other dimensions of quality of service, and I, that's a whole additional research agenda. Oh, yeah. But I think it's really important because it's not all just about speed. We're using that right now as, uh, as sort of the thing. But this focus on faster speeds to the detriment of business model innovation, quality, et cetera. When you ask people why they're not adopting you know, one service versus another, they like the customer service, they don't. They like bundling, they don't. Um, you know, they want some additional service, they want it you know, in different, with different add-ons and features, equipment, et cetera. So I do think, you know, not, to, not to say there's more to study, but I think there is more to study oh, than there is. focusing Absolutely. just on speed. Right detracts now. from the nuance that otherwise I think you're very correctly pointing out is, is important here. Yeah, I mean, I think what we do now is we, we do a, <clears throat> we spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out speed and then we use speed to explain everything else. So if people are not adopting, it's because of speed or price or whatever. But yeah, the, the questions that Scott raised about innovation uh, and utility, I mean, uh, that's sort of the follow-on work that I'd like to do is about what's the social utility that we're getting from these networks and sort of what kind of a network do you need to have to really maximize social utility and innovation opportunities. But these, the data in this report are the low-hanging fruit that we're, you know, the data is easy to come by. The point that Fernando raises about business model innovation I think is important given that we do have lots of options in the U.S. marketplace. I think business model innovation can meet non-adopters where they are with things like prepaid broadband or other kinds of things that people haven't thought of. So let's not forget uh, on the adoption problem that business model innovation can have a real uh, contribution. Great. So with that, we're 35 seconds ahead of schedule. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for, for coming. And uh, I want to thank uh, three panels for taking their time.